Church, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, man, look around this place. A great day. Look at your neighbor. Say you picked a great day to be at church. Tell them that it's a great day to have you guys here. Listen, if this is your very first time, we really believe you're here on an incredible day. My name is Jeff. I'm the pastor here, and it's an honor having you guys with us. We are in part two of a series called God of the Underdogs, and we're going to get there in a moment. But we've had so much incredible stuff going on around LifePoint this past week. I just got to take a moment just for us to celebrate everything that's been happening. This past week, our church hosted the very first UG conference. Now, real quick, hold on. I'm going to give you a second to clap. Hold on. You can eat into my time. All right. So... UG stands for, our, stands for United Generation. It's our student ministry, our middle school and high school. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, our team has worked hard to host a conference for students in this community. They had a crazy dream. I mean, crazy dream. Like, what if we could over three nights have a thousand students show up? That's insane. Well, how many know we serve a God who is able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine? Because over three nights... We had not 1,000, we had 1,296 in attendance. That's worth clapping for right there. It was phenomenal. So if you came in and you came through the parking lot, you're like, what blew up here? That was UG Conference, and you just got to go look at the pictures. If you've got an Instagram account, look up hashtag UGConf14, and you can see over 1,300 pictures that students took and posted. You can relive the event. It was incredible, and what was amazing was every night built on the night before. So Wednesday, 384 in attendance. Thursday, 435. Friday, 477. It was like they just kept bringing friends, and it was growing. So incredible. But the biggest you know, thing to celebrate out of the whole deal is this. We saw 117 students say, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, I know our UG team is exhausted, but I tell you what, these guys love teenagers. They've got UG happening tonight as well. So if you're middle school, high school, it's on tonight. And it's just incredible. Many of our volunteers from our dream team here, you're not even a part of our student ministry team, but you came out to support that. And I want to tell you, that means the world to me. I'm so proud to see the way our church stepped up. And people are like, man, are we going to do this again? Um, we're, we're talking about it. We think it's a good idea. You guys think we should do it again? I don't know. We'll see. All right, we'll see. So anyway, it was incredible, and I love being a part of a church that puts just a high value on the generation that's coming up. So many times people say, you got to take care of them kids, you know, those kids are the, they're the church of the future, and we like to push back and say, no, we think they're the church of today, right? We love being able to take care of the students and, and the next generation, which explains why if you're new here and you walked in and you're like, man, this place looks like, like, are they building this or are they tearing it down? What's happening? We're not necessarily into the sheetrock decor. That's not really what we're going for around here. We're in the process of expanding our entire kids' ministry, and we, you've caught us literally at the midway point. So last week, I shared with you a little bit about the project. I want to give you guys a snapshot of what's been done, where we are, and what you can expect, and how we're going to tackle that together as a church. So let me give you a, an update as to where we are with our kids' ministry project. So many incredible things have gone on. We're literally at about the halfway mark, right? Halfway. So to this point, we have demoed all of the space that was there, demoed the 6,000 square feet that was beside us, and we've started putting all the walls back up. We cut through concrete. We've laid plumbing. We've done electrical, and uh, it has been absolutely incredible. Like, there is going to be bathrooms in the classrooms, which is a huge 
upgrade from what we currently had. Like nursery workers are actually going to be able to wash their hands after changing a diaper. That's a great thing, right? So we're, I know they're excited about that. And so we're just thrilled about having a secure environment for our kids. We're even going to have an environment for special needs. It's just a great, great upgrade and expansion that we're having. And uh, so we're at the midway point. And uh, the things that are going to be happening soon, I wish I could walk all of you through there because I literally go through it every day because I just love seeing the progress. But we're going to see paint going up on the walls before we know it. And so that's going to, you know, suddenly begin to really put some skin on the project. And so we're excited about that. Keep praying. Pray that we don't have any surprises. Pray we don't hit any snags. The goal is we are done by late August because in early September, we throw a massive back-to-school fall kickoff party, and we want you to be able to invite all of your friends around the community to come see your church and see the new kids' space, and we think they're going to love it. So pray that we hit our deadlines. Pray that everything lands on schedule. Let me talk to you also about the other arm of it, which is the financial arm of it. The financial arm is always the fun one to talk about. I know it's no surprise, but they don't give these things away for free. We've been able to do this project because of the sacrifice, the giving, the generosity of our church. And I want to thank you guys. If you have given financially, you have underwritten things like the UG conference that we just hosted. And you are underwriting this project. And I want you to know how much... It means to know that we've got a church that believes in these kids that are coming up and creating a space for them. We told you when we started this project, we were looking at a construction cost of $500,000. And the good news is we're on target. We have had a few surprises, but nothing that has blown the budget. And so we are on target to hit our construction cost on our deadline of $500,000. Now, what that doesn't include is the wow factor that we want to be able to put into these rooms. The wow factor is the theming, the decorations, the audio, the video, the TVs. We've got the the theme has been set. It's a studio theme. So we just love that here we are in Wilmington, the third largest production industry in the nation. And we're going to have a studio theme. Kids love movies. So when they walk in, they're going to feel like they're walking onto the set in the back lot. And it's going to be incredible. We want kids' jaws to drop. We believe that they deserve the best, and if we're giving them the message of hope and life in Jesus, it needs to be done in the most excellent manner possible. So here's where we are. Let me give you the financial numbers so you know how to pray, and you can prepare to give. Here's where we are. We told you the construction cost is $500,000. The theming to do everything we would like to do is $200,000. So it's a total project cost of $700,000. We did a special offering in December, and we did a special offering at Easter, And those two special offerings combined are $127,000. Now, because of the faithful giving and generosity of our church, we've been able to save over the last 12 months. And we have the resources to make the payment and cover all of the construction costs. That $500,000 will be taken care of. We'll have walls. We'll have, uh, you know, the the, the framing will be there. What we want to do is be able to raise another $100,000. Two hundred is the total Another hundred is the immediate need, and that hundred will allow us to really create a space that pops, and these kids are going to walk in, and they're going to go, wow, and they're going to grow up in an environment where they know about the truth of God in a language they understand. And what I want to do is ask our church to begin praying about how you can help us cross over that hundred thousand line. We believe that it's going to take this entire family. We've gotten to this place by everybody giving, sacrificing, just honoring God in their finances. And we want to ask you to continue in your faithfulness, continue in your sacrifice. We are launching this weekend a new campaign, a part of our Make a Difference campaign. And we're doing it through a uh, website and an organization called Indiegogo. Some of you are familiar with this. It's a crowdsourcing campaign. And so you can write this website down, go visit it as soon as you can. You can go to lifepointnow.com slash mad. Make a difference, because that's what we're doing. Lifepointnow.com slash mad. And that's going to take you to our Indiegogo page. And I want to share with you, this is so neat. We've never done anything like this. We're really, really excited to see how all of this plays out. But what you'll find on this page is you'll find an explanation of the project. So kind of the scope of the project, what's happened thus far, what's happening in the future. We'll be able to update with progress on this site. But here's where, here's where this gets really, really neat. This project is going to require every single one of us to be able to play our part. And your part looks different than my part. And the neat thing is this church has not been built on the gifts of a few 
but the sacrifices of many. It's all of us saying, God, what are you calling me to do? It's not about equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. And you can see, here's a screenshot of the Indiegogo page. You'll see that as of last night, I, it was so cool, I announced this last night, and literally as I was announcing it, somebody gave the first gift of $250. We couldn't even screen capture it in time. So you see there's 500 That was as of last night. And what's super cool is that as a church, we'll be able to watch the progress of this roll out throughout this campaign. So you'll be able, like me, log in every single day and just see where are we at, how's the progress coming, what are the needs. And this is super cool. If you look at the right side of the project, you're going to see it says select a perk, all right? And so there's all different types of gifts that you can give to help us outfit this. Let's go to the next slide here. And you can see, you know, gifts range from $100 up to $8,750, and each of them give an explanation as to what that does, and the reason we did that is because we're all in different places in life. Some, you're, you're a college student, and a gift of $100 is an incredible sacrifice. I mean, that's like, that's like 20 macchiatos, right? I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're getting the jitters if you don't drink that. So it's an incredible sacrifice, and we want everybody to figure out what is that sacrifice that I need to make so that I can see this happen. And so you'll see a gift of $100, and it's called the Toy Story gift. It says this, no kid space is complete without toys, games, or play spaces. With your gift of $100, we will equip our kids' rooms with all of these. So in order to make this happen, we need 45 people to say, I'll be a part of that $100 Toy Story gift. And we want you guys to do that. And when you claim that, you're able to know that you got to help provide that. When the kids are playing with toys, you'll know, I did that. Then you'll also see we've got gifts at, um, you know, we'll pick one a little further up, a $500 gift. It's called the house seats. And it says, with your gift of $500, you'll be equipping our new space with seating, tables, and other furnishings. So all of the furniture that's going to go into these spaces, you'll be a part of that. And there's a need for 20 people to say, I'll give $500. And then the gifts continue to go up, and the reason you say, well, you know, you got gifts all the way up to $8,750, it's because we don't want to limit God. We know that God will put on individuals' hearts what he wants them to give, and it's our job to say, okay, God, I'm going to step into that. And what we've learned is over our existence that every time we step out, God steps in. I shared with you last week that, you know, this is, the story of Life Point is an underdog story. When we started the church, we didn't have any people or any money, and God provided and so many times as underdogs, we look at the obstacles rather than focusing on our God who is bigger. And we decided we're going to focus on our God. So I want to ask you, every single one of you that call Life Point home, I want to ask you to pray from now through August. This campaign ends on the end of August, August 30th. Would you pray and say, God, what would you have me give? Maybe sit down as a family. What would you have us give? Read through the different things that you can give towards. Maybe there's one that just sits on your heart more than another, and you think that's the one that I want to provide for. And we made this. It's 42 days long, so you could give now. You could give again in August. Our goal is that we cross this line and that we're able to open this kid's ministry space in a way that's going to absolutely make these kids' jaws drop. So I want to ask you to partner with us as we see what God does in reaching this next generation. Does that sound good? If you're in agreement, say amen. amen. Yeah, let's just see what God does as we charge forward. Having said all that, let's pray over that. Let's believe in faith. Let's pray over that and let's dive into God of the underdogs. Here we go. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God that calls us to challenges that seem so much bigger than we are. We truly feel like underdogs, but we realize that when you are on our side, that there's nothing that could come against us. There's nothing bigger than you. So we lean into you. We trust you. We say, God, speak to us. Challenge us today. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, if you've got a Bible or you got your phone or a tablet, I want you to go to two passages today. Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. Find Mark chapter 1. We'll start there. Have Luke chapter 3 kind of on the back burner. We're going to end up there. Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. This series about being underdogs is something that connects with every single one of us. We love underdog stories. All of us at some point in our life have felt like an underdog. Either we didn't have the strength, we weren't smart enough, we weren't fast enough, we weren't wealthy enough. We felt like the odds were against us. But what we discover is we serve a God who is bigger than any obstacle. And we're going to see God use underdogs all through this series. And so Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, before we get there, I just want to say this. There was uh, 700 years before Jesus was born, there was a prophecy from a prophet named Isaiah. 
Now, Isaiah is prophesying about the Messiah who is to come. This is a big deal. People have been waiting for this Messiah, this Messiah who is going to set things right, who is going to restore a relationship with God. Big news. And Isaiah says 700 years before Jesus was born, he says, there is going to be one, a forerunner, one before Jesus, who is going to make an announcement. He's going to set the stage for the greatest news the world has ever heard. And so we see this big announcement about to be made. Now let me ask you this question. You just answer this for yourself. If you were God, and you were going to make the biggest announcement the world has ever heard, you were going to announce the arrival of your son, your very son. They're going to name a holiday after him, right? It's going to be a big deal. He's going to live a sinless life. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to pay for the sins of the world. This is a big deal you want everybody to know. If you were God, who would you pick? To make that kind of an announcement, right? You don't want to just give that to anybody. I'm thinking if I'm God, I'm going with like a celebrity. I want somebody with like millions of Twitter followers, right? I want somebody that can make an announcement and the news stations are going to pick it up. Or maybe I want to go with a political figure that's got a lot of clout that's going to be able to arrange a press conference and get this word out. So if you were God, who would you pick to make the biggest announcement ever? Now remember, Last week, we learned that God is most likely to use who? Do you remember? God is most likely to use the unlikely. So oftentimes, God picks the candidate that we would overlook. So if you feel overlooked today, I want you to know that you very well could be a candidate that God uses to do something incredible. And so who does God pick to make the biggest announcement that the world is ever going to receive? Does he go for the power? Does he go for the prestige? No. No. God goes with the unlikely. He bypasses the popular. He bypasses the powerful. God picks Jesus' crazy cousin, John. How many of you got a crazy cousin in your family? Just raise your hand. Own it. Like, yeah, you know so-and-so. You're thinking back, family reunion. Your kids are like, who is that? You're like, we don't talk about them. Just move along, right? Every family's got a crazy cousin. John is like the cousin Eddie of the family, okay? All right? Now, how many of you, I mean, you can identify a crazy cousin in your family, right? You can think of one. And if you're like, I can't think of any, it's because you might be the one, right? <laughs> you, you're like, my family's normal. No, you're the crazy one, right? And so John is just a little bit off, right? John's just a bit odd. He's, he, he's not like everybody else. We know him in the Bible as John the Baptist. It's not because he went to a Baptist church or started, you know, Baptist. John baptized people. That's why he's called John the Baptist. And John is about six months older than Jesus. He's his older cousin. And, and John is what you might say like, how do I say this in like a nice manner? John is what you might call different. Different. I want you to get a great note card out. I want you to write this down. I've titled this message, I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. John is a little bit different. I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. John is a uh, he, he's a bit odd, as we're going to discover. We're going to look at how John is different, but John's a big deal. John is literally, he's written about in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. They tell the story of John the Baptist. Crazy cousin John is in there, and John is different. He's different in a lot of ways. I want to look at three ways that John is different today. I want you to write this down. The first way John is different is this. John looked different. John looked different. John had a, uh, he had a whole unique thing going. He was rough around the edges kind of guy. He looked like Grizzly Adams, kind of, anytime you see like a movie and John's in it, he looks like he kind of took the whole No Shave Ember challenge his whole life, right? He's just got this massive beard, his hair is all disheveled. He's just a unique looking character. He lives out in the desert. He's sort of on the outskirts of town. He's a loner. He's a different sort of guy. John had a different sort of fashion sense. The Bible says that John was, um, that he was one that dressed in camel hair. He was, he was odd. Let me show you a passage that speaks about John, all right? In Mark chapter 1, if you've got it, let's go and look at it together. Mark chapter 1, the Bible says this. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Here's what Isaiah said 700 before, years before Jesus was born. He says this. He says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And John wore clothing, check it out, here's his, uh, here's his get up. John wore clothing made out of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. John was different, right? He's got his camel hair get up, which I got to imagine was just scratchy, right? You ever worn something that was scratchy? How scratchy does a camel hair jacket got to be? So he's wearing this camel hair, this leather belt. It was not the fashion of the day right? It was the fashion of hundreds of years ago. It was the way that the Old Testament prophet Elijah was described to to dress. So he looked a bit strange. John John looked a bit odd. His diet was just a bit odd as well. He ate locusts and wild honey, right? You guys know what a locust is, right? It's like an oversized grasshopper. I mean, it's disgusting. That's nasty. Look at your neighbor and say, that's nasty, right? It's disgusting. We got a reptile in our house now. I told you guys last week we have this bearded dragon named Ollie. And the coolest thing about it, he's a cool little dude or girl, we're not sure. But the coolest thing is feeding him crickets. You drop a cricket in that cage and he goes into like hunter mode. Like he is stalking that cricket. He's just, just munches it down. It's neat to watch. I, I like that. But that's pretty much what John was eating, right? Locusts, dipping them in honey. Right? I don't know if the honey was to make the go down a little better, taste a little better. It's just disgusting. But here's John, and we don't really know why John looked the way that he looked. We don't know why John ate what he ate. We don't know why John lived the way that he lived. We just know that he was willing to look different. John was willing to look different. See, we live in a world today that says conformity is king. Like, don't be different. Be like everybody else. You are, a lot of people are like, you are unique just like everybody else, right? Wait a second. We live in a world that wants us to look the part and look like everybody else and live like everybody else. I want to tell you, we spend a lot of our lives, don't we, trying to blend in. When I look back over my life, I realize my middle school, high school years, I didn't want to stand out at all. I didn't want to be odd. I thought if I stand out, I'm going to be having lunch by myself. Right? I want to blend in. I want to look like everybody else. What are the fashion of the day? How's everybody else acting? What's everybody else saying? What's everybody else doing? And I tried so hard just to be one of the gang, to simply blend in. And I want to tell you today, God didn't create you to blend in. I love how John the Baptist was different. He looked different. Now, I'm not saying you got to go out and get yourself a camel hair jacket. I'm not saying you got to be weird. Like some folks are just weird for the sake of being weird. Some do weird really well. I'm not saying that you have to dress different. I'm not saying that you got to drive something that looks different. I'm talking about the way that we live. John lived different. Let me ask you this question. If somebody were to look at your life, would they say there's something different about you? If there's been a moment in your life when you said, I realize that Jesus is the Son of God, and He died on the cross for my sins, and I have asked Him to be my Lord and my Savior, There should be something different about the way that we live our life. When people look at us, they should say, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about you. Don't be ashamed to be different. Don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to zig when everybody else zags. Be different. What I love about this story is that here's John, and he's different. And if you go back and look at the passage, you discover that people came all out of the city of Jerusalem. They came from the Judean countryside to listen to this guy that was different. I think we live in a world that's waiting for somebody to step up and be different. Somebody to say, look, I don't have to pattern my life after everybody else. Matter of fact, the Bible tells me that I shouldn't conform to the pattern of the world, but I should be transformed. Is there something different about your life? If I were to observe you, would I see something different? Would I hear something different in the way that you live your life? See, listen, the world doesn't need another cheap copy of someone else. You're never going to figure out who you are trying to be someone else. One of the most scary things you'll ever do in life is step into your skin and learn to be who God created you to be. You know, people ask all the time, Jeff, what's the scariest thing? What's the hardest part about starting a church? You know, you've been at it for eight years. What's the hardest part? There's been a lot of challenges, but for me, the most difficult part was getting on this stage and being comfortable being Jeff. You know, I remember thinking, but if I'm myself, people may not like me. So I tried to be somebody else. I tried to preach like other preachers, and you can't be somebody else. And it took a while for God to get my attention and say, Jeff, I made you unique. 
I made you the way you are. I called you to this city, this place, this time in history to reach these people. And as long as you pretend to be somebody else, you will not experience what I want to do through you. And I want to tell you that you're never going to experience what God wants to do in your life. You're never going to be the underdog that overcomes so long as you pretend to be something else. You be you. Stop trying to be a cheap copy of somebody else. I love that John was willing to live and look different. The second way that John was different is this. Write this down. John's message was different. John had a different message for this day. His message, the things he said were different. The crowds were showing up to listen to this underdog, this oddball. And and yet John wasn't about building a fan base. He wasn't about pleasing people. He looked at his audience and he said some challenging stuff. See, in John's audience, all sorts of people were gathering, but some of his crowd are uh, what are known as Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees were like the religious elite of the day. You and I would look at them and we think, man, those guys have got it all together. Look at them, man. They got it going on. I wish I could be like that. And they looked really good. But Jesus had some choice words for them. He said, you Pharisees, man, you're like whitewashed tombs. He says, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. He's saying you're living by a system of rules, regulations, and you think you're measuring up, but on the inside you're judgmental, you're hypocritical, you're not loving people, you're not generous. He's like, you're not fooling anybody. And so John sees these guys showing up, and he has some choice words for them. Go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. John says to the crowd, and this is directed at the Pharisees and Sadducees, he says this. He says, you brood of vipers. Let me just clarify, that is not a compliment, right? We never compliment somebody by saying that they're like a snake, right? We think of a snake, we think of somebody that is deceptive, they're sneaky, they're tricky. He's saying to them, you brood of vipers. I mean, a viper is poisonous, right? They're associated with Satan. It's why I don't like snakes, right? Some of you snake people, I said this last week, you can repent following the service. We'll give you a chance down front, I'll pray for you. But he's looking at these guys and he's saying, you you brood of vipers, you're like a bunch of snakes, you're deceptive. He says, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What does that mean, produce fruit? How do I produce fruit? He's telling them, you put off this godly lifestyle, but there's no evidence in your life that you're you're really living a godly lifestyle. You, You look good, but there's no evidence of it for you and I. If we're living a life that is honoring to God, there should be some evidence. It's like if I took you outside and I said, that there is an apple tree. And you're like, how do you know? And I walked over and picked an apple off of it. I was like, look at the fruit. The fruit is evident of what is going on in what kind of tree it is. In our lives, there should be evidence that we're followers of Jesus. There should be evidence in our life. When people look at us, they should see the fruit. And so he says, guys, produce fruit in keeping with repentance because their life didn't have any fruit. He says, and do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. See, they're saying we come from the right lineage. We're from the right family. He's like, don't even try to play that card. He says, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He says, the axe is already ready at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. He's bringing a challenging message to him. He's saying, there's no fruit. There's no evidence in your life. You're not fooling God. You're not tricking God. God sees the real you. And he brings a powerful message. John's message was different. It was different in the sense that he didn't tell people what they wanted to hear. He told people what they needed to hear. You and I need people in our life that will not tell us what we want to hear, but they'll tell us what we need to hear. Have you got anybody like that? Or have you surrounded yourself with yes men that that just kind of tell you the things that you like to hear because it makes you feel good? We need people that are willing to tell us the truth and do so in a loving manner. His message was bold, and I love that. It was a bold message. It was a different message. His message was also convicting. You see, John spoke in such a way that the people walked away, and they were like, what should we do? John, we hear what you're saying. We, how should we live differently? Every time you hear a message or read the Bible, there should be some kind of application. What am I supposed to do with this? In Luke chapter 3, verse 10, the crowd says, what should we do? And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. He's saying, listen, 
here's what you should do. You want evidence in your life that, that you're, you've had a heart change, a life change. He's listen. John's message is one of generosity. And that's a countercultural message. We live in a culture that says, get all you can. It's about yourself. And John says, no, it's not about that. He says, if you have more than enough, share with the one who doesn't have enough. Be generous. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to other people. In our life, we live a countercultural message, a different message when we model generosity towards the people that are around us. But John doesn't stop there. I love that even tax collectors, look at verse 12. It says, even tax collectors came to be baptized. Now, tax collectors were not exactly favored people back then. I know that's hard to believe, right? Because everybody loves the tax collector nowadays, right? They weren't favored back then, but they weren't favored because they were crooks. They were wicked. They wouldn't just charge you what you owed. They gouged you on top of it, and they took more for themselves. So even these wicked tax collectors are showing up, and they're like, all right, what should we do? And so John replies to them. He says this. He says, verse 13, don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. He's saying this. He's saying John's message is a message of integrity. He's saying, have integrity. Have integrity. Do what's required of you, but don't take advantage of people. Integrity is letting your yes be yes and your no be no. It's standing up for what's right, defending those that need someone to defend them. It's taking a stance for truth. That's integrity. He's saying you want to be different. Model integrity. Live a life of integrity. And then verse 14, soldiers show up. And the soldiers say, and what should we do? And he replies, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Soldiers were known for taking advantage of people, using their power. And John's saying, don't abuse your power. Here's what I find so amazing about this crowd that has formed around this underdog, this oddball dressed in camel hair, eating locusts and wild honey in the middle of the desert. These people are gathering around him. You've got the religious elite, you've got tax collectors, you've got soldiers, you have an interesting crowd. And I just find it so fascinating that one guy that is willing to be different, to live different, to step into his purpose, has somehow attracted and garnered the attention of everybody else that was in the region. I think that's so interesting. The third way that John was different is this. Write this down. He didn't just look different. His message wasn't you know, the only thing that was different. The third thing is this. John's purpose was different. John had a different mission, a different purpose, and he was willing to live it out John's purpose was different. Luke chapter 3, verse 15. The crowds are gathering, and it, we're told that the people were waiting expectantly, wondering. They were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. You see, it had been predicted through the Old Testament that the Messiah would come, the Son of God, to take away the sins of the world. And they're looking at this guy, John. I mean, this, this is a guy that, uh, you know, he's not here because of his power and his wealth. I mean, this is a guy that is, he's risen up from, from nothing. And they're wondering, is this the one that the scriptures have talked about? Is this the guy? Look at the crowd. Look at the authority. Look at the confidence and the boldness of which he speaks. Could this possibly be the Messiah? Now, put yourself in John's shoes for a moment, right? If you're John, like, this is your big break. You know, I've been in the wilderness for a long time. I've been eating locusts and wild honey for a long time. These people think that I am the Messiah. I have created this platform. They're looking at me. If I say yes, I'm the guy, like the days in the wilderness are over, right? These people, they're going to they're gonna crown me as their king. People are going to serve me. This is going to be incredible. This is his moment. Like I'm going to get a steak. No more crickets. And I love how he responds Verse 16, John answered them all. He says, listen, whoa, 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 whoa. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. And the straps, this, this one, the straps of whose sandals I'm unworthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's going, whoa, 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 not so fast. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not about me. I am not the Messiah. I'm not the one that you think we're all waiting on is I'm just trying to get things ready. I'm trying to set this up. I'm not building a platform for myself. I'm building a platform for the one who is to come. It's not about me. I don't even deserve to untie his shoes. Like, uh, it's not about me. It's not about me. 
Tell you what, when we start living a life that says it's not about me, we will be different. Because we live in a world that says you got to get yours, you got to get the attention, you got to build your name, you got to market yourself, you've got to be somebody, you've got to get more degrees, you got to make more money, get a bigger house, upgrade, get attention, get your 15 minutes of fame. And John's going, no, 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 no. He knew that his life was not about drawing crowds to himself, it was about creating and preparing the way for the Messiah who was to come. John was comfortable in his own skin. And that's what made him different. That's what set him apart. He was okay not being in the spotlight. He knew he's a stagehand in the story of God. He's just getting it ready. He's not the, he's not the lead role. And I want to tell you today that there is a part in the story of God with your name on it. But the story is not about you. The story is about Jesus. And you and I, like John, get to introduce people to him. And the craziest thing happens one day. John is down at the river and he's preaching and he's baptizing people and all of a sudden Jesus shows up. And this had to be one incredible moment for John because John is like, points to Jesus. He's like, God, everybody, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus does the unthinkable. He approaches John and he says, I need to be baptized by you. And John's going, wait a second. No way, Jose. Like, you, I need to be baptized by you. I'm not baptizing you, and Jesus says, no, this is the way it should be. And John gets to literally baptize the Son of God. Is this just amazing? John baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes out of the water. A voice from heaven says, this is my Son, whom I'm well pleased. And then all of a sudden, many of John's followers begin to follow Jesus. And you got to be thinking like, whoa, 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 John, this is a bad PR move right here. Right? John, we had a good thing going, and now they're all beginning to follow Jesus. And John responds by going, look, I told you, I am not the Messiah. John's followers are going down. Jesus' followers are going up, and John's okay because his purpose was different. His purpose was not about creating a bunch of followers, garnering a bunch of followers for himself, but about pointing people to life in Jesus. He was setting the stage. That's all he was doing. His purpose was different. And what I love about the story of John is here's this oddball, this underdog that God uses to overcome all all kinds of obstacles. There's all kinds of reasons that nobody should have ever come and listened to John. But God takes this underdog and turns him into an overcomer and uses him in a powerful way. And I want to say God wants to do the same thing in your life. But here's what I want you to know today. I want you to write this down. Write it in your notes, the margin of your Bible, your arm, I don't care. Write this down. Underdogs who overcome are okay being different. Underdogs who overcome are okay being different. Are you okay being different? Are you okay embracing what makes you different? What makes you unique? Or are you busy trying to just be like everybody else? I just want to be- to just blend in. I just want to fit in. I just want to fly under the radar. Can I tell you, God didn't create you to blend in. Let me ask you this question. This is just something for you to answer for yourself. Maybe ask God to speak into your heart and help you discern what the answer to this should be. The question is this. What area of your life have you been trying to blend in? And God is now calling you to stand out. What is that area of your life? You've been flying under the radar. You don't want people to know. You don't want to, you know, make waves. And God's saying, I put you there for a reason. I put you in that neighborhood. I put you in that classroom. I put you at that job for a reason. I want you to stand out. Now, let me make something clear. Standing out does not mean, like, I'm going to go out to the mall today and buy, like, a whole new wardrobe of Christian T-shirts that says, like, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? All right? Don't do that. All right? The world doesn't need that. We don't, we don't need you to go get a Jesus is my homeboy T-shirt. All right? You don't got to go get, like, 12 gold crosses hanging around your neck. Be like, I just want people to know that I'm down with JC, you know, me and Jesus. You know, he's like peas and carrots. I'm not saying you got to go that route. You certainly don't need to go get a bullhorn and stand on the corner and start yelling at people. You don't need a sign. You just got to be willing to be different, to be who God created you to be. See, in our world, the great thing is it doesn't take much to be different. Being different means I'm going to show up to work tomorrow on time. What a thought, huh? Your employer will be like, what are you doing here so early? Well, actually, I'm just on time. 
Being different means I'm going to finish my projects on time. I'm going to follow up with clients on time. Being different means I'm going to do the best that I possibly can. And someday when your boss or your employer comes to you and is like, what's, something's changed in you. What's, what's different? You're going to say, listen, I just happen to believe that everything I do, I'm supposed to do to the glory of God. And so I show up to the glory of God. I do my work to the glory of God. I help others to the glory of God. At some point, you do that long enough, you will look different and people will say, why is it that you do what you do? For some of our students, you're going to go back to school here in a little bit. I know you don't like to hear that, but it's going to happen. And you're going to have the chance to walk through the doors of that school the same way you've always walked in, or you can walk through different. You can be different. And I want you to know that God is calling you to be different. God is calling you to befriend the person that doesn't have friends. He's telling you to stand up when everybody else is sitting down, to stand up for truth, to stand up for injustice. You know, here, like kids that are in here, you know, you be different at home. You, you, you know, you go and you, you clean your room to the glory of God. Amen, mom and dad? Mom and dad are like, What'd you, why did you make it so clean? You're like, because this is God's room and I just felt like I should do the best I could, right? I'm going to take the trash to the street to the glory of God. Amen, mom and dad? I'm going to scoop poop out of the yard for the glory of God. My kids aren't in this service. I don't have to keep preaching this point. But you want to be different? We just start doing everything we can to the glory of God. And at some point, I promise you, you'll have an audience. And in that moment, it's not about you. Just like John, you're going to go, man, my purpose is to create and point people to Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's about him. That's the only reason I I do what I do. That's why God wired me the way he wired me. Maybe today you need to ask God to show you your uniqueness. God, how have you wired me unique? What are you doing to call me to be different? Where are you sending me, God? Like, do the people that you see on a regular basis, do they they know that there's something different about you? Do they know that you're a follower of Jesus? Would they know? What would it look like if you began to be different, to be who God created you to be in that environment? That's all you got to do. And in that moment, just like John, you're going to be an underdog who overcomes and points people to Jesus. Let's pray together.